Today we're going to talk about Jonah some more. And um, so as, as we're looking at it this week, we want to talk about, see, last week was about Jonah's prophetic prayer, but this week we're going to talk about Jonah's influence on the church. Because what I am discovering is that this tiny, teeny little book in the Bible, anybody go back and read the whole book? You spend five minutes to read the book. It's really a small book. You can actually read it twice in five minutes and, and, and move through it. Studying it is a different story. But then what happens is, as, uh, what's, what's been happening is God has been revealing to me that, that the, the, it, it's not just the four books, but the, the, the story tells so much more, and it actually uh, proliferates throughout the entire New Testament if, if we have the, the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the heart to understand. And so uh, we, we, we drive in just that bit more. If, if you remember, we opened up talking about that when I became a man, I put away childish things, and that God is telling us and, and, and leading us and showing us how to put away childish things so that we can move forward to the deeper things with him. And one of the points that keeps jumping into my mind and my heart and my spirit is that one of the things that Jonah did in the time of this prayer, as he was running away from God, running to Tarshish and the big storm, and they threw him overboard, and the, and the fish uh, 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 swallowed him up and, and, and put him through literally hell, that somewhere in the mix, Jonah stopped playing games with God. That was part of his prayer. I'm done trying to do me. Now, actually, he didn't even bother to say that. He just said, God, I'm all about you. He didn't bother to say, he didn't bother about, I'm not going to do about what I want to do. He just said, I'm going to just do what God, that's, you'll say that when you're buried in a fish. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Perhaps we all have spent time like Jonah, though, running from the call of God. Chasing a calling that wasn't God's calling. Perhaps we spend time going through cycles. Anybody here likes to cycle, likes to go around the mountains over and over again? You know, the wash cycle, the rinse cycle, the recycle, and, and, you, and you keep running back through the cycles. Uh, and, and what happens is and we get wrapped up in the consequences of our own obstinance. We, we get wrapped up in the, cons, uh, in the, in, in the consequences of, of our own uh, disobedience, of our own desires, doing what we want to do rather than what God has called us to do. And, and so wrapped in the weeds kind of gives us a, a picture of that. And I think of the, 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 the significance of Jonah's statement, the, reeds, the weeds are wrapped around my, my head, and that when we run from the Lord's calling, think about it, the weeds were wrapped around my head. When we're running from God's calling, our, our minds can get all tangled up can become uh, stifled and smothered. And, and, and have you ever had your head wrapped up before? Come on, y'all, somebody here was dumb enough to put a plastic bag over their head when they were a kid. Anybody? Just me. Okay, Matthew. Was it recent, Matthew? No. Uh, you ever had the experience of, of being held underwater or drowning or, or, or feeling that? And so, like, what can happen, though, is when you get all wrapped up like that, your senses are, are stifled. You can't see straight. You can't, you can't hear. Uh, and, and the only thing you really want to do is get air. I just got to get out of it. And so someday that's where we are in life. We're so wrapped up in, in the weeds of our own disobedience that we don't think straight. Uh, we, we, we can't see what's right in front of us. We can't hear what's being spoken to us. Our reality is now taking a shift from living to just trying to survive, just trying to get life, just trying to get air. So let me just review a little bit. I, I, I shortened it, but let's take a look at Jonah chapter 2 which was uh, Jonah's prophetic prayer. Say those two words, prophetic prayer. prayer. We're going to hear those words a lot. I guarantee you God's going to speak to you about, about praying prophetically. And again, it's not prophetic prayer like maybe what's commonly taught. We're not trying to make things up. We're not trying to uh, decide what we want and then declare that God's going to give it to us. We want to be very careful about that. What we want to do is pray what the, the Spirit of God reveals to us to pray. Amen. We want to follow the, the, the leanings of the Lord. So Jonah uh, 2, verse 2, after being swallowed by the fish, he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Remember that, that cry had two different uh, meanings. There's two words cry right there. And, and one is, is crying out very specifically to God. Not any God. Not any old God will do, get me out of this, but, but praying to the Lord God Jehovah. Uh, uh, pray, and for us, we're, we're praying to the Lord God Jehovah. We're praying to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we, we're, we're crying out specifically, any old God will not do. If my God is not going to deliver me, then I'm done. I'm over. Amen? And then the other part was to cry out uninhibitedly. 
you know, with, with no inhibitions, being able to cry out. When you are stuck and you're in a situation, you're not worried about the people that are around you. You're not worried about how you might sound. You're not worried about being poetic. You're not, you're not worried about a, 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 a metronome flow when you're praying and, and out of desperation. You're just going to pray. And I've said this three times in the last week, and I'm going to keep saying to it, when, when you are, are, are praying out to God, you're crying out to God, don't be worried about the people that are around you. They don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. That you are, are focused on the things of God. They might be able to wipe your tears or rub your back, but they cannot deliver you. Right. Only God can do that. Verse 4, he said, Then I said, uh, I, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. That's the part where he said, I'm done playing games. He said, The water surrounded me, even to my soul. Uh, that, that's, that's a picture of death. death. The, 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 the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the, to the moorings of the mountains, where the mountains are fastened to the earth, and the earth with its bars closed behind me. This is such a picture of it's over. It's over. I'm, I'm going down to the depths of the earth. I'm going to the place of the dead. And he says, and the bars are closing behind me, meaning there's no way out of this. I'm going to die. He says, um, yet you have brought me up. You have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. That is one of the most significant statements. Impactful. When my soul fainted means my soul gave up, my soul quit, my soul died, my mind, my will, my emotions. All of that was dead, gone. And what remained? The spirit. And so the spirit cries out to God. He said, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. Say that, voice of thanksgiving. thanksgiving. We're going to come back to that a little later. He said, but I will pay what I have vowed, and salvation is of the Lord. So what's happening, and then the next verse says that God spoke to the fish. He spoke to them. They're like, well, I don't know what he said to the fish, but it made the fish puke and vomit. He vomited uh, uh, Jonah off onto dry land. That is so significant. When God speaks, things happen. I wonder how long that prayer had to go till Jonah said the right thing and was changed and turned around so God could send him on to minister at Nineveh. That almost rhymes. God is sending you to minister at Nineveh. That means if it rhymes, that means it's anointed. Amen. Amen. But today I want to talk about how, how Jonah influences the church. That I, when, when I start to see certain things, I just get excited. I run downstairs and start yelling at Michelle. You won't believe what the Lord just showed me. You got to say it, but you can't talk about it because I'm going to preach on it. And if they've already heard it, they won't receive it from me. And Michelle's like, ooh, I want to share it. But the first point in the message is this. Jonah's mission begins with reorientation. We talked about that a little bit last week. But, well, we talked about it on Wednesday, actually, about, about the first step of prophetic prayer being reoriented. In other words, I'm not, I'm not... I'm being shifted. I'm being turned around. There's certain things that I think God wants, and so I can, I can start to pursue these things. But if I'm not running in that direction, I need to be turned around. I need to be, be, be facing the right direction. See, see uh, what, what happened with, with, with Jonah was he, he turned, and he, and, and he went to Tarshish. She tried to run away. When God said, go, go east, he said, I'm going west. And so he's trying to hide from God. He's hiding. He's, 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 paying his, he's paid his own fare. He's, he's, he's hiding in the bottom of a boat. And he's trying to go to a place where he thinks God's not there. And so this is a prophet who, who's missing it altogether. And so the first thing we look at this, this need for reorientation. We need to sometimes just have things turn around. We need, we need the, the ship uh, uh, steered correctly. You know, we, we, we pray often about uh, that whenever I'm missing it, Lord, uh, you know, let, me, let there be a voice behind me uh, saying this is the way now walking it whenever I stray to the right hand or to the left hand. And so we need the, the voice of God that's leading us and guiding us. I, I, I love the part in Scripture where it talks about that God leads us with his eye. He directs us with his eye. God looks in a certain direction, but that's the direction that I'm going to, to go in. 
to be able to make that, that connection. And so we think about this and this, this, this reorientation, and, and it's important for us as, as ministers, as evangelists, as, as people who, who give a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, those who, 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 uh, who, who bear witness of, of who he is, it's important for us to realize that not everybody is going in the right direction. Do you know some people that are going in the wrong direction? You know, and, and, and so um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an expression, there's a, 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 a quote that says, until a man knows that he is lost, he never knows what it is to be saved. Until a man knows that he is lost, he'll never know what it is to be saved. And we say many times that we cannot understand the mercy of God until we understand the wrath of God. And so what, a lot of times when we are, are testifying and sharing the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, 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 we fail to mention hell. <laughs> we fail to mention that, there is a, uh, that, that, that God is, is, is not all ponies, clowns, and balloons. But, but that the, the, there's a, 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 a give and a take, and that God's wrath, people say, that, well, that's not fair. And you say, well, it, it, actually, you should be glad that God's not fair, because if God was fair, none of us would be here breathing today. Yeah, so so God, God is merciful. He is, he is, and he's justified. And that's a, God, God's wrath is justified. However, it's satisfied. He satisfied it himself by giving us the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the requirement that we can fall under that sacrifice that we believe? That we repent, we turn from our old ways. That we, that we uh, repent and be converted, that we are now shifting and turning from what we once believed into, uh, w into the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, so the, to the truth of the, the gospel. We spent several weeks talking about the truth of the gospel, and we get it into our heart, get it into our spirit, so that when we get poked, that's what bleeds out. You know, the, the, the very truth of, of the gospel will change your worldview. It changes the way that you think and the way that you see it, and that is necessary, even, even for us as believers. How many of y'all are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet you still need your mind fixed? You still think about bad things. You, you still think about things you should not ought to think. You think a way that you know you shouldn't be thinking, but I can't help it because this is just how I think. Well, the Bible says we must be transformed by the renewal of our mind. And it was written to believers that we must be transformed by the renewal of mind. Lord, transform my mind, I pray. Jonah was reoriented in this time in the fish. And, and I, I think this is such a powerful statement. He was reoriented when his senses were stifled. He was reoriented when he was going through the worst point in his life. He was reoriented when his old man passed away. And so the spirit now lives. And now he has changed and transformed and, and now he's moving in the right direction. How many of you all recognize that you are called as missionaries? As a believer, just two people are called to be missionaries. That's amazing. Whether you're a missionary locally, in your local community, in your house, you are representing the kingdom of God. And some of you will have a, a call to, to, to go to far off places and to bring the gospel with you. Anybody feel like, I want to go halfway across the world and I want to share the gospel? Wow, we some y'all are chickens. I'll tell you, there's there, there's a there's a call that is there, and you know you might go, you know, and it might be, and, and sometimes it's like, you know, well, what if you could go to Hawaii and do, and people get excited about that. But you know, more often than not, it's going to be places where maybe you are uncomfortable. And I'll tell you what, if it's an uncomfortable place where I'm called to bring the gospel, I want it to be effective. Well, I paid the price to get here, and now what I want to do is be effective, and I can't effectively share the gospel if I don't know the gospel. If I don't believe the gospel, if I don't agree with the gospel, if I, if, if, uh, how can I be effective otherwise? That makes me a, a hypocrite. And even though I might be effective at it, I, I, I'm not going to get the reward. I won't get the, the, the total level of, of effectiveness because I have not yet attained the witness. Amen? So some of us are called, just like Jonah. Look at Jonah 3.1. We're going to do Jonah 3 today. But Jonah 3.1 he says, now the word came to Jonah a, a second time. The first time he ran. Hopefully he learned his lesson. Let's see. The, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, now arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. He's being called as a missionary. 
And, 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 God's, and don't just go tell them anything. Don't just go out there and pull something off the uh, sermoncentral.com or whatever. But preach the message that I tell you. you know, how many times has God said, go and do what I told you to do? But then when we go, we don't listen to what God has for us to do. We just do what we think we know. We sit there and, and we just, just cycle through all the voices in our heads until we find one we agree with. We say, that's the Lord. That's like Russian roulette. But God says, go and, and preach to Nineveh the message that I tell you. Leads me right into my second point. Jonah's mission models the Great Commission. Jonah's mission models the Great Commission. Now, sometimes we think, how can that be? How does this line up? How does it add up? And as I've been looking through the word, grasping, understanding more and more and more, let me drop this on you. Y'all call me later and tell me I'm wrong. The Apostle Peter, when Jesus addressed him, and he was sending him out. You remember? You know, who do people say I am? He says that you are Christ. That you are, are, are the, the, the Messiah. Who do people say I am? He said that you are the, you know, Elijah. That, that you are, are this prophet, that prophet, or some other prophet. Right? And then he says, but I say you are the Christ. What did Jesus say to him? Blessed are you, Peter, bar Jonah. Peter, son of Jonah. Let me, let me, so, so Peter's father's name was Jonah, maybe. But did they not refer to Jesus as the son of David, not son of Joseph? And Jesus only referred to Peter this way when he was imparting something, when he was laying upon him a mantle. Then he was, he was called a, a Peter, son of Jonah, or bar Jonah, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading. It means the same thing. And so there, what, what it's talking, there's an extension, there's a continuation of the call of Jonah that now is set on Peter. Woo! I ran around the house. I began to understand, because now I'm starting to see things differently. And so I'm looking at the mission of Jonah, and I'm saying that is the precursor. That is the forerunner. That is the foreshadowing of the great commission that would be uh, uh, imparted to us, the New Testament church. Amen. Mark 16, the, new, the, 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 the Great Commission. Of Mark 16, 15, Jesus says to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and tell them the message that I will tell you. What was the message? Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be saved. Condemned. That is the message. That is, the, the, that is the, the, uh, the great commission to go and preach this message. If you will believe, you'll be saved. But those who don't believe, they will be condemned. So a lot of times when we're performing the great commission, we're only doing half the great commission. We're only doing the part that says that if you believe, you'll be saved. But then we don't necessarily get into the part of if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. And then he goes on, but signs and wonders will follow those who believe. In my name, they cast out demons. They speak in new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And, and if they drink any, any deadly thing, no, no, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And, and so the promise that goes with it, but the promise is, and what's the precept to the promise? Preach. Preach the truth, both sides of it. And then if you believe, these are the signs and wonders that will follow. Look at the power of Jonah walking in God's Commission. Look at the power. Go back to Jonah 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey. So get from end to end of this city will take you three days to walk. And that's a big place. And Jonah began, day one, to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and he said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It, in a sense, this mirrors Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He said that this is, this is the Christ whom you crucified. And, and it brought such, such a heart. It said it cut them to their heart. 
They said, well, what must we do? He said, you know, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, repent and turn around. Turn your life around. Turn to Jesus. There's a, a message that's in there. There's a mirror that's there. So Jonah cried out in the street. We talked about that last week, crying out, determining to God and uninhibited. And here he's crying out to God, Jehovah. He's walking in a, in a, a Gentile city where they worship foreign gods. So he had to be very specific. So he's here, 40 days and it will be overthrown. But it says he cried out and said. So there was the crying out to God and then there was the declaration of the condemnation. So he was preaching one heck of a rounded sermon right there. The term crying out determinately means to God, and perhaps determinately he was calling out to the people as well. You, <laughs> you're going to be condemned. You're going to be condemned. And praising God all the while. So he was a forerunner of the Great Commission. As, a New, Te as, as New Testament Jonas, our message is the love of Jesus. Amen. It's, it's the cross, it's the grace of God, but it is also preaching the dread and damnation apart from Christ. The truth must be preached. It must be told, amen? And if you don't have the stomach for it, don't countermand those who do. You know, when when, when the, that message is being preached and it's bringing conviction and condemnation, see, we don't need to offer comfort at that point. We need to offer the way out. We need to offer the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, there's a whole lot of people who are very convinced that they're going to hell. They're very convinced that at the end of their life that they are going to be spending some time in a very bad place, but they don't understand the way out. There are also some people that may actually be headed that way that think that they are safe and they're fine and secure in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet they've never repented. They've never turned around. They don't think that hell is a real place. They think that this is hell and this is the end of it. That's why everything seems so miserable right now. I got news for you. It gets worse and it gets better. So on which side of that line you want to run down. Amen? Amen? Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. God, that's so good. Hey, all he said was, 40 days, the city's going to be overthrown. I mean, it, it, everything's going to be turned upside down, demolished. And maybe they heard of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe they heard that these things are coming. And so as he's preaching, he's preaching in the name of the Lord, preaching in the name of, 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 of Jehovah. He's, he's there, he's, he's, he's saying all these things. And then in verse 5, it says, so the people believed God. They didn't even say they believed Jonah. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. A sackcloth. Anybody know what that is? That's a very hairy, itchy garment. And the reason why they would put on sackcloth was a, a sign that they were mourning, a sign of their own sadness. It was an outward sign that they were, they were repentant, that they were or they're, they're putting on, on, on brokenness, they're putting on sorrow. That as they're doing, see, and, and here's the interesting thing, as we look at that, that was a, a culture of the Israelites. But these people were not Israelites, they were Ninevites, they were Assyrians. But yet they began to now adopt the culture of the Israelites to demonstrate that one, uh, they're serious about things. Two, they acknowledge that it was the Hebrew God. Then this happens in verse 6. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid aside his robes and covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. That five and six verse is so significant to me because what happened is that the people responded before the king. Before the king, we even heard about what was happening. The people were like, we cut to the quick. What are we going to do? We believe. Here's what we're going to do. What are we going to do? We're going to call a fast. And we're going to put on the sackcloth and, and we're going to let our cries and our wailing go up to heaven. And then the king says, what is happening out there? What's going on? And so it's interesting that they, they, they responded and believed before the king did. And, and listen, for good or for bad, we have to realize leaders are influenced by people. Our civic leaders are influenced by people. 
You know, even in politics today, we look at all the craziness and the madness that's going on, but, but, but they are influenced by the people. They hear the voice. They hear the cry. There's an influence that happens. And, and I'm looking forward to a day when we see a lot more politicians begin to fear the Lord. They begin to fear the things of, of, of God. They, they, they start to, to move into a, a godly place. Even better yet, I would love to see some people in a godly place get involved in politics and start to influence that world system to recognize that, that government should be subject to the kingdom of God. So there's, there's this, this, this dynamic that takes place. I think every year for the past four years, in the first week of May, uh, we, we go out to uh, City Hall, the National Day of Prayer, and we pray on the steps of City Hall. And, 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 and I've been doing it for four years. I don't know how many years we've been doing it all together. But, but it's an interesting day. It's an interesting thing that takes place because people will come from everywhere. You know why? Because there's a crowd. Why everybody standing in a circle? You want people coming and stand right in a circle. What are we doing? We praying. Okay, let's pray. And, and so you're there and, and you're watching people peeking out the windows like, what are they doing out there? And you know, what's, what's happening? You know what? And we're right there, right in front of City Hall doors, and the mayor's office is right there. And so we're out there and we're praying. And, and one of these days, maybe you'll come out and join us. But you know what we like to do afterwards? A couple of us sneak in. Go in, and we hand him the notes. This is what we were praying about. Uh, he's not here today. I know he's not. Will you please leave that on his desk? Let him know that, that the, the city is praying for him. Not the River Church, not this church or that church. The city is praying for you. We're going to have some impact going forward. Amen? So Jonah continues in, 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 in uh, uh, verse 7. It says, and, and he caused it to be the king caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. And the king caused it, think about it, to be uh, proclaimed. So people are yelling it out, published, writing it out, putting it on the, on the door. Uh, he's causing it to be preached throughout the entire kingdom. And he says, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. They put sackcloth on their animals, and, the, and, they, and they made them fast. And he said, and cry mightily to God, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, there's a turnaround right there, and from the, the violence that is in his hands. He said, acknowledge your own wickedness, repent, cry out, and proclaim a fast throughout the land. Doesn't that baffle you? We're like, let's proclaim a fast. We say yes, and, and maybe 20, 25 people say, we will fast. I'm like, and that's it. They said, look, the dogs, the cats, the cattle, the fit, everybody, everybody's going to fast. Why? Because there's a conviction. Uh, trouble's coming. I mean, the Lord is coming. When God says he's going to destroy something, that means he's coming. And so, and, and, and what did the king say? The king said, let's all do this because maybe, just maybe, God will relent and change his mind. I don't know where he got that idea from because Jonah didn't preach that. He said, 40 days, it's over. Pack your bags. It's time to get up out of here. But they said, let us see. If, if, in verse 9, he says, uh, uh, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we will not perish? Despite Jonah's merciless preaching, still the people look for hope. That's Peter on the day of Pentecost. Merciless. These people are not drunk as you say. This is that which was promised by the, by the prophet Joel, that the, the Holy Spirit has come upon flesh and others speaking in divine tongues. And so let me tell you something. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. David prophesied the coming of the Lord. This was the Messiah, and you killed him. Can you imagine that? You mean that was the promise we was waiting for? That was the Son of God? I, I heard he was the Son of God, but I didn't believe it. And now, only thing we're entitled to is death, hell, and damnation. And the response was what? What should we do? What do we do? So a, problem, a lot of people are not turning to true conversion because they don't understand the wrath that they have been spared. 
and our job and the Great Commission. And it's not all ponies and balloons. It's preaching the truth so that that conversion can take place. <laughs> Third point, this is the big one. Obedience is incomplete without agreement. Obedience is incomplete without obedience. Despite Jonah's reorientation, despite the time he spent in the belly of the fish, despite the fact that he was a a great prophet of the Lord, he stepped out only in obedience, but never in agreement. Obedience does not require agreement, but true deliverance does. See, this is the the shifting of the mind, the renewal of the mind. I know this is what God wants me to do, and I'll do it. How many times have we done that with the Lord? I don't want to, but I'll do it because I know that's what you want me to do. I don't know if I agree with that, but I'll go along with it. I'll do it just so I don't get punished by God. How many times, I mean, I, I'm guilty of myself saying, Lord, I don't want you. I, 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 I'll do it only, but you got to give me a sign, then I'll do it. Knowing full well this is what God wants me to do. Look at Jonah 4.1. After Nineveh repents, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. It displeased Jonah exceedingly that the city had repented. And he became angry. Y'all get mad sometimes? And God doesn't do what you want him to do? I mean, he got mad. He got, he got mad because people got saved. He got mad because Jonah determined that they weren't worthy of salvation. They weren't, they weren't worthy uh, uh, to be spared. And that's why he ran in the first place. Verse 2, he says, he, he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord! Sometimes we pray, ah, Lord, was that not what I said when I was still in my own country? Didn't we talk about this already? Therefore, I I fled to Tarshish, for I know, now watch this verse, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. That is an interesting statement. I'm like, I, I, I read that over and over and go, Jonah, what were you thinking? Wait a minute. Were you thinking that you could run away from God and God would excuse you from running away from him because this is the nature of God? Or were you thinking it was because he would excuse Nineveh and whatever was happening in Nineveh and you wanted no part in their salvation? It's an interesting note here. Jonah's ministry was to proclaim the goodness of God and the restoration of lost things. The only other prophecy that Jonah is is used for in the Bible was in 2 Kings when he prophesied the restoration of all things to Israel. So he said, I'm not going to do that for Ninevites. I'll do that for Israel, but I will not do it for others. I think about that. I think about Nineveh. And I think about times when I, but some of you, have determined that somebody is not worth salvation. Uh, People groups. That's racism. Jonah had some racism right there. Can anything good come out of Nineveh? He was like, yeah, smoke. But to have that thought and that mindset of making a determination who God would save and who God would not save. Sometimes all somebody needs is the right warning. They just need to hear that warning and they'll come to the Lord. They got to know that everything is not all right. They got to know that God is not working out all things because you're not in line with what God wants you to do. Look at verse 3. Jonah continues and says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. (laughs) 
I mean, no, but he, was, he wasn't being dramatic. That is, he was serious. Like, God, kill me because you didn't do what I said, that, what I prophesied. You didn't do that. And, and now I'm so mad, I just want you to kill me. So God responds in verse 4. He didn't say yes, praise God. The, the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Is, is it justified for you to be angry? I mean, God could probably say, it's justified for me to be angry, and I've chosen not to do this. But is it right for you to be angry? Jonah's reorientation, the first point, it wasn't complete. He wasn't done yet. He needed some more time in the fish. Jonah still wasn't safe. Imagine your preaching being strong enough to bring an entire city to salvation. Your preaching being strong enough, I mean, the entire population of Haverhill, Methuen, and Lawrence. That's how big Nineveh was, population-wise. All those people heard from God and turned from their way and relented before God. And so the, the, the preaching was, was, was that strong, and yet at the same time, you disagree with God. Telling God, I don't think so. Can you imagine saying to God, I, I don't think so. There's great rejoicing in the city. God has relented. We, we survived, and, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll live for another day, and, and the people are now oriented towards God, and here the prophet of God is mad about it. Like, you succeeded. Why are you so mad? You, you did what you were sent to do, but he was so mad. Jonah still wasn't safe. His heart wasn't in the right place. And here's the thing. A lot of times we'll do the same thing. We'll get mad because we see somebody else beginning to prosper. We'll get mad because we start to see a turnaround in their life, and, and you are, are still angry, still offended. You still, you still kind of got all this stuff off to the side. That you're, you're not happy about that progress. You're not happy to see these things happen. And when we begin to speak against that, what we're doing is we're speaking against God's perfection. You don't know what you're doing, God. That's speaking against God's perfection. You might get away with that when you're little, but when you're grown, when you're maturing in the things of God, you might recognize the weight of saying that God is not perfect. That's blasphemy. And Amos wrote it. Amos 3.3 3 says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? You know, if I don't agree with God, I'm not walking with him. And you know what? Sometimes God does things I don't get it. I don't understand, so I'm not in agreement. But here's, here's the thing. I need to get on my face and ask God to change my heart so I come into agreement with him because I don't want to be outside of his perfect will and grace for my life. Jonah would rather die than to be wrong. And here's the thing. What Jonah preached was not wrong. It's just that God relented. Destruction was coming to Nineveh. So that, that he, he wasn't wrong. He was incomplete. And God just had relented. God's bigger than, than, sometimes God is bigger than the word that we speak. Amen? So God sent Jonah that he might be merciful. That was the purpose why he sent him. In this sense, uh, we can see Jonah as a foreshadowing of Christ. He sent, he sent Christ that he might be merciful to us. Aren't you glad the mercy of God is greater than the predictions of men? I think about that all the time. You're, you're, you'll never be no good. You're just like, you're just like, like everybody else in your family. And everything else is going to be just what it is. And, and nothing good comes out of Lawrence. Nothing good comes out of Haverhill. And, and you're looking, you're like, aren't you glad that God's passion for you, his mercy is greater than the predictions of men? Let me double back to Jonah's um, mission being a foreshadowing of the Great Commission. It makes me wonder if Jonah only gave half the prophecy. Skipped over the second part that says, he who believes will be saved. And jumped right to the condemnation piece. Because that was what was in Jonah's heart. Perhaps God knowing of, 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 perhaps in knowing of God's gracious and merciful nature is what made Jonah a great prophet. Because he understood how great God really is. How merciful he is. I said he, he was sent to, to, to Judah to prophesy the mercy, the grace, and the restoration of God. See, that was his word as a prophet. He just refused to do it for Nineveh. So God isn't done with Jonah just yet. God is so good to us. God loves us too much to leave us incomplete. He might be able to squeeze some obedience out of you, 
but God wants agreement with you. The story continues. Jonah goes out of the city to watch and see what would become of the city. He went up and sat on the hill and sat down to watch and wait to see that city destroyed. He's still there. So what does God do? God prepares, prepares a plant, a tree, that would spring up over him. See, it was hot. It was dry. You ain't going to make it, Jonah. So I give you a tree. And then think of a tree that springs up in a couple hours and provides shade. Jonah must have been like, I'm back in the good graces of God. Let the fireworks begin. It says Jonah was very grateful, but as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and so damaged the plant that it withered and it died. Just think about that. It came up in the morning and it died in the evening. So reading Jonah 4, 8, it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. I think Jonah just wanted to die. Like every little thing, I wish I was dead. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plan? Jonah, you've got anger issues. And he said, Jonah answered said, it's right for me to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, you have had pity on this plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right hand and the left hand and much livestock? Just think about what God is saying here. Now, what he's saying is you're worried about a plant. You're worried about your comfort. You're, you're worried about how, like, how things look for you in your own situation. And he says it's a plant for which you have not labored. And so by implication, he's saying, Jonah, do you not see the work that you have accomplished? You labored for these people. This was, this was the work that I did through you for all these people. And you're mad about the outcome. But here's the, the covering. Here's the plan. Here's, if, if we can get this and understand, see, God wants more for you. God, God wants more for his bride. God wants more for his church. And so as, as we, we are looking at this message of Jonah, you start with first this whole orientation piece. Like, what am I looking toward? What am I actually oriented toward? Am I still kind of doing things my own way? A am I following a, a, a path that is not where God is leading me for today? If so, I need to be reoriented. We looked at it with David. Remember what, what David did was David said, uh, 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 on my righteousness, you have rewarded my righteousness. Right? And so, so David, we know, wasn't always righteous, but there were seasons where David walked in absolute righteousness. How did he get there? He repented. He turned away. He knew the heart of God, so he got back in alignment and agreement with the things of God. That reorientation needs to take place in many of our lives. Yeah, I tell you, in, in my, in my uh, study, in this time as I've been working through it, I'm discovering something amazing about God. In a, in a very roundabout way, I'm studying this, which brings me to look at this, which makes me explore this. I come back around, and, and I come to a, a, a name for God, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And I'm looking at this in context, and I'm thinking, I believe God wants to do some healing. I believe that, that there's, there's sickness even in the room today. And the reason why you are still sick is to hold you, to hold you in your relationship with God. Because the day that it's over is the day that you're over. The day that you leave, the day that you walk away. But here's it, if you can come to a place of agreement with God, it will unleash the healing power of God over your life. So if we, if we can recognize, God spoke that to me this morning. And you can choose to believe it or not believe it. You can choose to accept it or not accept it. But you've got to come to a place of agreement with God. 
And for many, I'll tell you right now, the, the Word of God, it's here. It's preached. You're, you're, you're hearing it, but you're not getting it. You're not going for it. You're, you're still playing games with God. You're still trying to, to run off to another place where there's, there's, there's a, a blessing that's apart from God. There's a, a place where the, the Spirit cannot convict you, a place where, where you, can't, you can't be touched by God. And in your mind, you're thinking, God can't see this. God doesn't know that. God, these are my thoughts. I can't help how I think. This is my dilemma. And to recognize, you just need to come to a place where you say, you know what, God, I agree with you. I agree with your word. I, even if I, I'm not totally there yet, I'm making a decision to agree with you. I'm, I'm getting in line with, with what it is that you're saying for this day and for this hour. And, and by your spirit, bring me online. Bring me on course. Help me to do it. Anybody here, you get mad at people? Some of y'all mad at people right now. But the Bible tells me you need to forgive them. The Bible said, love your enemy. That there's, there's this, this coming together and, and adjoining and, and coming to a place of agreement. He says, look, I'm mad. I, I, I feel unforgiven. I'm, I, I don't want to let this thing go. I, I, I want to see them. I want to see, I want, I want to see them uh, and, and with Nineveh getting bombed from the heavens and, and all these things. But, but God said, pray for them. Uh, heap coals upon their head. Heap the blessings of God upon their head. And, and I think about this, and I said, that you could win a brother. You could win somebody to the Lord, but you're doing the work of God if you will do this. You've come to this right place of, of alignment. And do you know what you find when you get to the place of alignment? There's a three-letter word that challenges us today. It's elusive to many of us. That word is joy. Joy. Inexpressible Joy. Joy that comes from the Lord. In the name of the Lord, there is joy. He is the source of my strength. He is the source of my joy. My joy comes from the Lord. One of the things we've been talking about and for many weeks, we're going to keep right on talking about this until we get it. God wants to do something with your emotions. God wants to do something with your emotions. You know what God wants to do with your emotions? He wants to rule over them. He wants them to come into a right place, a right alignment with your emotions so that you can now move to a, a different level altogether, that you can now start, begin to walk with him in a different way. And I realized, see, I, I whispered to Michelle during the worship time, and I said, God wants us to manage our joy, to manage our joy. And, 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 and that's what she said. She said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like that. I like that. Give me an amen. That's good. So what, what, what happens is, how many of y'all have a problem with joy sometimes? Yeah. That joy, is, joy is a choice. Oh, my gosh. Did you just say that? You just stepped all over the doctrine I just adopted this morning. You make me unhappy. So you know what? Good. It's not my job to make you happy. My joy to lead you somewhere. See, if I can manage my joy, the rest of my day is going to be all right. So where do I get joy? Where do I get it? From God. He's the source of joy. My joy cometh from the Lord. The scripture says it in, in just this way. So what we need to do is to be able to go to God to get the joy, to fill me up, to get me to this, this next place. i tell you, well, you want to be a leader in, 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 in Christ, you want to be a leader in the kingdom of God, you better have some joy because people are not attracted to angry face. How would you like to come to Jesus if he looks like this? <laughs> come here. I'm not going over there. You have to catch me. Where's Jesus? There's joy here. There's joy. But it's, it's a rough road. That's all right. It's nothing compared to the joy that's coming. Just, just keep coming. Just, keep, just, just get, get to that place of being filled up. You know what happens when you're empty on joy? You become an animal. When you are, are, are empty on joy, you are carnally responsive. Because you, you, you don't have this heat. That's why Jonah ran. Because he was not filled up with the right stuff. He was ruled by his emotions. That's where he fell apart. He started to come back in the whale and the fish. And then you see here on the other side, it never says what Jonah did after this. That was the end of the story. Sort of. Because the story continues today. You'll see many parallels of Jonah to the New Testament church. 
He's influencing us all the time. His story by way of the Holy Spirit is influencing the church all the time. We just don't always recognize what it is. But to recognize that God has commissioned us to do more, to be more influential, to be more effective. And we do this by way of the Holy Ghost. Amen? In a moment, we're going to take communion. But as we are making this shift, I began talking first today about the weeds, about um, how it is when we are disoriented. We can be wrapped up in these weeds. And these weeds can be the result of our emotional state. These weeds are the result of our, our obstinance, of our disobedience to the things of God. And so we can be wrapped up in these weeds, but God wants us to be free from this. It's going to take a, an about face. It's going to take a turnaround. It's going to take the reorientation so that you can wiggle free. It's going to take a word from the Lord to get you out of the belly of the fish. But all of that is preceded by a change in your mind. So if there's anybody here today, you know, you're saying, you know, Pastor Dave, I need to get free from this. I've got weeds all around me. I feel like I'm being pulled down into the deep. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. I want to I lay hands on you. If you're here today and, and that's you, I just want you to start making your way down to the altar if that's you. I need to get free from these weeds. I need, I need to, to get out of this mess. But even as, as, as we're getting ready to pray, there are some here, the reason why you're going through the mess in your life, the reason why you can't seem able to break free, even your healing is conditional upon you coming into a place of agreement with God, agreeing with the things that he is showing you and that he is teaching you, not just going out of blind obedience but operating in a place of, oh, God, I agree. I know you're a good God. I know you're a powerful God. I know, Lord, that life can be hard, but you are with me and that you have the answer. If you're a person, maybe in your life, in that area or another area, you know that you're out of agreement with God. You're walking differently. If that's you, I just want you to come down to the altar. I want to pray with you as well. Just make your way to the altar. We serve such a good God. We serve such a righteous God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.